get the chance to take this course on one psychology where I strongly recommend it. It's really fascinating. Um, Russell McCone has a PhD in social psychology. He worked for seven years at Rand as a behavioral scientist, and he joined the Berkeley faculty in 1993 when he's a professor of law and public policy. He's a visiting member of the faculty here as well. His um, area of expertise is uh, cognitive and social psychology perspectives on public policy. And he uh, has a very, very, very long and diverse list of publications on topics that include drug use and drug laws and jury deliberation and bias. And today he's going to be talking about the psychology of opposition to harm So, um, feel free to interrupt me as we go along if you have questions. And um, I feel like I'm giving off schedule. I may pull things back on, on track, but I'll be interrupted. So um, to get us started in today's topic, I want you to think about the drug Rapsidol. Rapsidol provides an intense, but not unduly frightening, altered state of consciousness full of intellectually and aesthetically intriguing mental imagery and a profound sense of love for all living creatures. <laughs> These sensations last for approximately 30 minutes and vanish completely, leaving absolute, producing absolutely no detectable changes in one's life, outlook, or mental or physical functioning. They can only be experienced by sitting or lying in a completely stationary position. Any abrupt physical movements end the psychedelic state and return one to a normal state. Moreover, because of neurochemical processes of adaptation, the effects can only be experienced once a day. Now, um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have tried Rapsidol. <laughs> uh, Rapsidol doesn't yet exist, uh, except for in my mind. Um, and uh, what I would like you to think about is if Rapsidol did exist, um, it, would Rapsidol use be immoral? And then, the legal policy question, if perhaps it all is manufactured, if someone invents this, should it be a Schedule I prohibited uh, substance? So I presented this thought experiment to lots of audiences of, over the years, and I get, I get really mixed reactions um, depending on the audience. Um, with Berkeley, a lot of students want to know where they can get some. <laughs> but, um, um, yes, yeah, many people just have a that's some sort of instant reaction that this is this is fine and, and of course it should be legal. And other people seem to have as quick and almost visceral reaction that no, this is not right. It, it, it should be prohibited. And now, why did I give Raps at all the features I did? I tried to come up with a drug that would give someone an experience without any of the um, consequentialist harms that we associate with illegal drug use. So it's not addictive. Uh, it's not possible to drive a car. Um, if your kids interrupted you, you can't be a bad parent because you, the altered state of consciousness would end the moment your kids interrupted you. So I, I, I really took care to try to come up with um, a drug that would um, give someone an altered state of consciousness without um, the, the usual consequentialist. So that's really what I want to talk about today. Are, um, there are many stigmatized um, risky activities for which people get pleasure uh, or some sort of aesthetic experience. Um, maybe um, people will claim a spiritual experience um, from the activity. Um, but the activities are often associated with physical safety health risks, and um, it's sometimes possible technically to reduce those risks. Um, rarely can we eliminate them as we can with rats at all, because it's, it's just hypothetical. But it's often possible to reduce the risks, and yet some people, um, and I'll show you evidence on this, some people uh, object to reducing the risk of these activities. So um, in a paper in American Psychologist in 1998, I suggested that um, a useful way of thinking about alternative strategies for, for drug control 
is to distinguish what I call prevalence reduction, quantity reduction, and micro harm reduction. Um, prevalence reduction is the, the dominant, in fact, almost the exclusive focus of American drug policy. By prevalence reduction, I mean you count how many people are users or non-users. You categorize the population into users and non-users, and you count those. And if you look at the um, Office of National Drug Control Policies uh, list of national goals every year, almost all the goals are stated in terms of reductions in the number of people who are using illegal drugs. Um, another goal that we might uh, pursue, um, which is not mutually exclusive, is quantity reduction, trying to reduce the quantity of drugs that are consumed. Um, which wouldn't necessarily reduce prevalence. There may be the same number of people using, there could even be more people using, but the average dose per person would go down, and um, the extreme doses of, of the more frequent users would go down. And then finally, a notion that really comes out of grassroots movement in, in cities like Liverpool and, and Rotterdam and Amsterdam uh, uh, with the advent of uh, the link between AIDS and injection use, injection drug use is harm reduction, but here I make a distinction um, uh, between total harm and average harm. And so when I talk about micro harm reduction, I'm, I'm talking about reducing the average harm per dose of, of, of a drug. Now, um, I find this distinction more use, these distinctions more useful than the traditional distinctions in drug policy debates about supply reduction and demand reduction, which um, are almost exclusively focused on prevalence reduction, um, and also uh, tend to confound um, tactics with strategies, in particular programs. These are, these are well, there aren't even programs, they're budgetary categories. It's really about budget allocations. Um, um, and the, these strategies, I'm going to skip over this one, these, these, these strategies of prevalence reduction and quantity reduction and harm reduction are in tension. They're not mutually exclusive, but they are in tension because um, each of these interventions can have both intended and unintended effects. So um, prevalence reduction is mostly what we try to do. We try to do this through prevention and um, treatment, especially abstinence-oriented treatment. Um, uh, deterrence in the criminal law and incapacitation. Um, and uh, and the, the, the major focus here is going to be on um, prevalence the number of users. Quantity reduction uses a lot of the same tools, but tries to reduce the total units or total dose um, per user. Um, harm reduction tries to reduce the average harm per use. Now the dot these combine to make up the level of total drug-related harm we experience in society. And um, total harm is going to um, <laughs> be equivalent to average harm per dose. You, one way of thinking of it is per dose of the drug multiplied by the total number of doses. And this leads to the, the fundamental um, dilemma that makes it so hard to decide whether we should legalize drugs. Um, and uh, in, in the book Drug War Heresies, Peter Reuter and I argued that um, legalization would almost certainly significantly reduce the average harm per dose of cocaine or heroin or the other currently illegal drugs. So average harm would go down. Legalization would almost certainly increase the number of doses that are consumed. And the, so the fundamental empirical dilemma is You've got a trade-off here. Average harm goes down, total doses go up, and uh, so whether total harm goes up or down is really going to depend on the magnitude of these two effects. And at present, um, other than a leap of faith, we really don't know um, uh, which of those effects is, is larger. So this doesn't mean legalization is a, a bad idea. It means legalization is a risky strategy. But of course, our current strategies are also risky strategies. Our current strategies cause a lot of harm. And in fact, there are all sorts of things that can be done within a prohibition regime to reduce uh, the harms of drug use. And uh, Western Europe is quite, and Australia are quite far ahead of uh, the US in, in, in pursuing some of these options within a prohibition regime. Even the Netherlands is not legalized. Even cannabis is not formally legal in the Netherlands. Um, 
that's another story, but I, I've written a lot of papers about that. But um, so there's a tension here, and uh, you know, I I could easily, you know, just talk about drug policy and harm reduction, um, and and give a talk on policy analysis because one of the professional hats that I wear is really as not so much as a psychologist, but as a policy analyst, thinking about what would be the effects of changes in policy. But today I want to wear my other hat and really talk more as a psychologist about why it's been so difficult to um, uh, implement harm reduction strategies in the United States compared to many countries in Europe. And uh, I've pursued this um, with a series of public opinion surveys, and I'm going to talk about three of them today. And um, um, the, uh, the first two are random digit dial surveys. These were embedded in statewide surveys of California adults. By embedded, I mean that uh, I had one module in a large, longer survey. And um, this made it much more affordable for me to do the surveys. It also reduced, I think, the quality of data collection compared to because um, the people who are responding to my modules here are also being asked questions about taxes and um, state governance and all sorts of other issues. And um, so my questions are buried within there. Um, and I think that added, added some noise to the data. So um, one of the things I mentioned in the paper here is that the, um, the, the R squared, the amount of variance accounted for by the variables I'm looking at, is, is fairly small. The first two studies suggesting there's a lot of noise. My third study is with UC Berkeley graduate students who are just answering my questionnaire and some of the UCB R squared go way up. Um, nevertheless, I think there's a lot of consistency across the surveys. One thing I just, as long as I'm giving my caveats, I want to mention a great disappointment of the second survey for all the participants was that the response rate uh, dropped from 76% a couple of years before to 25%. Um, there has been a a, a steep drop in, in the response rates in general, but this is this is particularly steep, and it, I think it mostly has to do with the sheer number of modules that tried to be included in the second survey, and, and people just didn't want to stay on the phone for 45 minutes or whatever. So, um, um, so with those caveats, those caveats just mean we're going to uh, the, the fact that. The effects that I describe here are emerging from a background of noise. The fact that they're emerging despite the noise um, suggests that there really is something here. And, and in fact, the results are consistent across the surveys. But, um, now, the first survey, I asked people to consider uh, four different risk domains. And, um, one of them is sort of the canonical example of harm reduction debate, uh, needle exchange, the debate over needle exchange for heroin injection, um, but um, you know, a major vector of transmission of HIV is needle sharing by injection drug users, and if you provide clean services and needles, you can significantly reduce um, HIV transmission, but a lot of people, people in the United States have really objected that saying, it's immoral and it encourages healing injection. Um, another very familiar domain is the domain of, of teen sex and safe sex interventions for teens. Um, and I, a particular example would be um, school programs that provide free condoms to high school students. Um, there's strong public health arguments for doing so, but there's been um, enormous resistance in some schools to doing so. Some parents have been quite upset about this. Again, seeing that this somehow encourages to be sex or uh, sends, sends the wrong message, is the phrase. Um, now, the other two domains are less traditionally thought of as harm reduction. Uh, one is tobacco, where there's actually quite a lively debate about harm reduction and where, in fact, the tobacco industry has really been embracing harm reduction. Um, and, and people feel they've been embracing harm reduction as a way to try to avoid. Um, efforts to res restrict the sales of, of tobacco products. Um, and an example of tobacco harm reduction is the use of filters. Another is low tar. Um, 
cigarettes. Actually, it's a, a nice illustration of the, of the, of the tension between harm reduction and, and prevalence reduction and, uh, and quantity reduction is that when, you, um, when smokers smoke low tar cigarettes um, or cigarettes with filters, they um, tend to smoke more of the cigarette. And as a result, they partially offset the amount of um, uh, harm reduction they would actually get. Um, there's a similar study with marijuana and, and bongs. Water pipes can filter out a lot of the dangerous substances in marijuana, but people get so much marijuana in their lungs that they end up offsetting the harm reduction. So it's, it's a tricky, tricky technical problem with how you produce these risks. Now the final domain listed here, skateboarding, is not a traditional hot button <laughs> issue, and that's why I picked it. I wanted to pick a risky activity. In fact, skateboarding is an enormously risky activity um, uh, with very high injury rates, and some of the injuries can be quite severe. Um, but it's uh, it's legal. It's not stigmatized. I could have picked something like high school football, but I wanted something that had a little bit of a countercultural. Uh, feel to it. You know, skateboarding has its own culture with its own um, style of dress, its own graffiti, its own music, and things like that. So I wanted to, to get a little of that. So I asked people about skateboarding, and the harm reduction intervention was um, whether cities should provide um, special arenas um, for skateboarding where skateboarders could um, skate in a, in a safer environment. And, um, and what you see here, the, the, the two bars are. The gray bars show people's support or enthusiasm for prevalence reduction, reducing the number of people engaging in the activity. Um, and I've ordered these in terms of decreasing support for the second bar is harm reduction, um, people's willingness to support harm reduction. So one of the things you see is for skateboarding, very few people want to stop. Very few people want to ban skateboarding. Most Californians are okay with the existence of skateboarding. Um, and so um, the notion of regulating the risk by trying to make it safer uh, strikes me as pretty reasonable. I found surprising the amount of support for harm reduction for teen sex. I thought I picked this as a hot button issue, but at least in California, I found that the majority of California adults were actually pretty comfortable with the idea of providing condoms for free in schools. Um, which is not to say that there is an opposition. The people who were opposed were quite um, strongly opposed, um, but they were a minority. Um, for tobacco, um, you see there's a support for a mix of, of strategies, both harm reduction and prevalence reduction. For heroin injection, you see much greater support for trying to stop people from using heroin than for trying to make heroin injection safer. Although, again, um, California adults uh, um, by a slight majority, uh, we're willing to support legal exchange. California, probably not representative of, of all parts of the country here, and I'll just acknowledge that. For my purposes, the representativeness is less important than making sure I have diversity of viewpoints, because I really want to study the diversity. I just had a question about your skateboarding control. Um, how was the how was it phrased to the respondents? Only because they could see sort of the isolation of skateboarding into special parks as a form of prevalence reduction in their neighborhoods or something like that? Or was it described as outright illegal versus parks? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I don't remember the exact wording, so I'm not going to think it. Um, but but I'll, I'll just, rather, I'm just going to grant that that's a, it's possible that I'm picking up that issue. So just so everybody's on the same page here, yeah, as I understand your, your idea is that people might partly be reacting to getting these skateboarders out of my parking lot, out of my, um, the front of my office building, out of my, um, in front of my house or apartment building. Um, and so it, to some extent, they might see the rink as a way of trying to, and I think that's a, that's a very real possibility. Um, the, uh, uh, I will just stipulate that there are many differences between there are many dimensions and I can't fully isolate. I think the second study um, does more in pinning, pinning down specifically specific types of harm reduction, prevalence reduction, but um, uh, um, I think that's very possible to suggest. So, um, 
So here I mostly just want to show that there are differences of opinion across these domains and that they're, um, um, and in the, I want to skip ahead to the next survey where I really looked in more detail at a broader range of domains, but I also tried to specify different types of prevalence reduction and harm reduction. And as we'll see in a moment, I asked more detailed questions about the basis for people's attitudes toward these policies. So in uh, the study two, I, um, <coughs> I looked at six domains. Heroin injection, again, was in the first study. Uh, teenage sex, again. But I added uh, alcoholism, illegal immigration, air pollution, and fast food. And so I want to take a second to talk about but what harm reduction might mean in each of these domains. So for alcoholism, um, there is uh, a well-established prevalence reduction strategy of um, urging alcoholics and persuasion or prevention to stop drinking. Um, uh, but another possibility is that you could actually re-prohibit alcohol um, to make it illegal to use alcohol. Um, I didn't expect to find strong support for that. Um, I actually found stronger support than I expected, but, um, uh, but uh, it's a possibility. And then in terms of harm reduction, there's sort of a soft version of harm reduction, which would be um, teaching alcoholics who refuse uh, uh, to quit drinking how to better control their drinking. Uh, and then a technical solution, which would be um, helping alcoholics monitor their alcohol consumption with meters to adjust their, uh, address their own alcohol level. Now, these harm reduction strategies for alcohol have been within the alcohol treatment community enormously controversial um, under the guise of, of controlled drinking because empirical studies suggest a lot of people who go through alcohol treatment do not stop drinking, but they significantly reduce their alcohol consumption. And by various consequentialist indicators of functioning, they, they function better, their health is better, their work, their employment history, their family lives are improved. Um, but they haven't stopped. But of course, this really runs into tension with the 12 steps notion that it's absolutely essential um, for an alcoholic to just completely go cold turkey and stay abstinent. And so there's been a lot of resistance to the notion that you could actually teach alcoholics how to manage. Um, now, illegal immigration is not what we usually think of as, as um, it's certainly a hot-button issue, but it's not what we usually think of as a harm reduction issue. But in fact, there's an active debate about to what extent we should be providing education and health benefits to illegal immigrants, or especially to their children. And, um, uh, and you, you, see the, you can see a parallel to the notion of sending a wrong message. The concern is if we provide these benefits for the children of illegal immigrants, we're encouraging people um, uh, to uh, immigrate uh, to the United States illegally, um, and we're sort of enabling them to violate the law. Um, air pollution, um, you think about air pollution trading credits, emission trading. Um, it's a way of trying to, um, basically, allowing people to pollute by trying to reduce um, the, um, the total harm. And uh, although it's less controversial today, uh, 15, 20 years ago when it was first proposed, it was, many people thought it was an appalling idea that you would actually allow people, some polluters, to pollute and you would basically give them permission to pollute in these uh, trading credits. Uh, and then fast food is, is increasingly becoming morally stigmatized in American culture, so I wonder if we do that as well. Um, and again, I've arrayed these in terms of decreasing support for harm reduction. Um, and uh, so we have the most opposition to harm reduction for heroin injection, controlled drinking, uh, plus so for air pollution, uh, teen sex, illegal immigration, fast food. For fast food, Californians are, um, uh, prefer harm reduction to prevalence reduction. I was quite surprised 
that there was actually a lot of support for trying to um, basically stop people from being able to eat fast food. Um, <laughs> and again, this is California, <laughs> but um, the Midwest where I'm from, I think that would be a tougher sell. But, uh, um, so again, I just, again, I'm less interested here in the, in the, the mean level of support than I am. And um, in this study, I was particularly interested in trying to understand what is it that makes someone prefer prevalence reduction, trying to stop the behavior from harm reduction, making the behavior safer. Um, and uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with um, multiple regression, um, but, but, but so I'm going to show you some numbers and then I'm going to give you a summary, a couple summary slides that, that tell you the key points. But I just want to show you sort of the strategy here is, so you have favorability toward prevalence reduction as a defender variable, favorability toward harm reduction. Um, the difference score between those um, which is sort of an index of how much you prefer one over the other. Um, and then, um, I'll talk about this one in a second. And I entered various, but there are lots of predictors, and I'm, I'm not showing all of them here. Um, uh, but I, I basically, what, we, what I'm looking for is what are the independent predictors? Independent meaning, there are lots of things that are correlated with um, opposition to harm reduction, but what are the predictors um, that uniquely seem to predict holding all the other ones constant. And so I'm gonna take all these coefficients now and just summarize it in words um, by telling you first the variables that failed to independently predict preference for prevalence reduction over harm reduction. Um, gender was not a, a independent predictor. Religion, here's where independence matters. Religion, uh, is correlated with opposition to harm reduction. Protestants in particular um, were more opposed to harm reduction than either Catholics or Jews. Um, but uh, that doesn't that that effect goes away when you also um, measure self-reported conservatism, um, which uh, Protestantism is correlated with. Um, <laughs> there, there was no relationship between people's perception that behavior was common normal um, or frequent, um, and their, their attitude, the possibility that the behavior is fun didn't affect people's attitude toward these policies. So the libertarian view that this behavior is no one else's business, there was definitely people who endorsed that, but it did not turn out to be an independent behavior. And then um, the uh, various items that just asked about whether the behavior was harmful or harmless were not independent predictors of attitude toward harm reduction. And I want to really underscore that. The perception that the behavior is harmful um, did, was not an independent predictor of people's attitude toward reducing the harm. Religion. Um, Jew versus Christian or strong versus weak? Um, so technically what these were were um, what are called dummy variables. Dichotomous, I, people indicate uh, the religious affiliation in the survey and um, and then I break those into a, a zero, one code, one if they're Catholic, zero otherwise, one if they're Jewish. So it was and, 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 the style of religion, yeah. not the strength. There is actually another item that measured the strength, the uh, degree of religiosity that was also correlated with attitudes, but uh, it also disappeared when I controlled for conservatism. Okay. And so one of the things that happens is, in, at least in American culture, religiosity and ide political ideology are so correlated um, that one of the, the, the two, of the two, the one that emerges as uh, more central, I think, is ideology. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, now, what were the major predictors of preference for prevalence reduction over harm reduction? First, age. Um, uh, younger respondents were much more comfortable with harm reduction. Um, because this has not been studied over decades, it's very difficult to know whether this is an age effect or what's called a period effect or a cohort effect. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be that we will always observe that young people are more comfortable, and maybe the young people in my survey will become less comfortable with harm reduction as they get older. That's very possible. Uh, another possibility is that we as a society are moving, and that this suggests we are moving in the direction of greater comfort with harm reduction. Um, I would say that the latter story characterizes Europe. Uh, so it's, it, there's at least a precedent for that. Um, and you can even see the, the geographic 
diffusion of harm reduction from the Netherlands and Britain um, working its way to France and Germany, which were quite resistant, and Italy, um, Spain, uh, gradually adopting um, harm reduction. So it's possible that we're seeing you know, real secular change here. Oh, now, then there's a cluster of attitudinal variables. Um, and these were very correlated with each other, these items. The pers uh, an item that asks, when I think about this behavior, so the behavior might be eating fast food, um, I, I think it's immoral. And they strongly disagree. When I think about it, I feel disgusted. Um, strongly agree, strongly disagree. I think the behavior is irresponsible. These items were very correlated with each other. And if you remember in that regression table, I, I had two separate columns. Um, you can combine those items into a single index called, which I called moral outrage. Um, and um, if you combine them together, they have the single best predictor. Uh, and I'm the first to admit, and I say in the paper, this notion of moral outrage gets used a lot in, in various literatures. It's not a well-defined term, and um, it's not always entirely clear where we draw the boundaries between moral outrage and other judgments. Here, I'm mostly defining it statistically in terms of items that flow together and that it seemed to be a good name for them. But I want to say that I, I believe, especially in the third study, it will become clear that these are, these tend to be more affective, emotional, visceral reactions, um, possibly more deontological in a sort of Kantian moral sense. Um, and I would distinguish these from more consequentialist views of, about technically how do we reduce harm in society. In society. And again, in the, in the third study, that will become clearer. So people are having this reaction to the behavior itself. Um, and um, if they feel the sense of moral outrage, they, they don't want to enable the behavior. And I want to talk in particular about one of the items discussed. Disgust was the single best predictor. In fact, if you, if you throw all the items in and tell the computer to use what's called stepwise selection of variables, which is actually not a good practice, but I did it just to check, um, the, the very first <laughs> variable it will, it will, the computer will pick is disgust. It's the single best predictor. Um, and this, the, the reason I include in the questionnaire is because this, is, this emotion of disgust has been of enormous interest in psychology and law for um, a number of years now. Um, starting with what seemed at the time to be very, uh, in the 1970s, what seemed to be very eccentric research by Paul Rosen uh, on, on the psychology of disgust. Paul Rosen would give people tasks like, um, he'd give you a, a fake plastic ice cube with a fly in it, and you put it in your drink. And yeah. But that's a classic disgust face. You just see the, see the mus musculature. There's a certain disgust. People, even though it's even though it's plastic, and it's an embedded uh, uh, fly, people really have trouble drinking a drink that has this um, floating in it. He would let them dip it in rubbing alcohol and then clean it off and put it in. And then he did things like, okay, so one participant in the study would spit in a glass and he'd ask the other one to drink it. And he would stop them before they did, but it didn't matter because no one volunteered to drink it. <laughs> so people find that really disgusting. So then he would ask people to spit in a glass and then drink their own spit. And people have trouble drinking their own spit. <laughs> um, and, um, and he's done all, he did all sorts of studies with whether you would wear a sweater that was worn by someone who had committed certain crimes and things like this. And uh, it, it's, uh, when these studies first came out, they seemed very eccentric to me. But um, what, he, what these Paul Rosen showed in his studies was that um, he got interested in this because of uh, his interest in the evolution of um, adaptations to, to avoid contaminated food, rotting meat. And, um, and to avoid people with contagious diseases. And he argued that evolution really would strongly favor people who recoil at 
the smell of rotted meat or spoiled food, or at seeing people with open sores and, and contagious conditions. Um, and he was originally just interested in this um, mechanism, but he came to realize that this, this mechanism, which is pretty good evidence, it's just hardwired into our brains, gets sort of hijacked by um, new moral phenomena that were not part of our um, Paleolithic hunter-gatherer history. Um, so for example, he studied vegetarians who had eaten meat most of their life, but as adults decided for health reasons or environmental reasons or moral reasons to give up meat. And what he found was within a few years of giving up meat, the sight of meat would disgust them. He found that people who gave up cigarettes after smoking and being addicted would be disgusted, and it showed this sort of disgust face when they would see other people smoking. And he argued that this moral system, which is much newer, is built on this old, much more ancient framework of, of um, a disgust mechanism, which is a part of the brain called the insula. And um, again, it, it seemed a little eccentric to me, but now I'm a believer in this, not only because of my own data, but so, so example, recent studies show uh, if you have people smell foul smells, ambient smells in a room while they are reading court cases, they are much more punitive to the defendant. Uh, the flip side is, if you give people an opportunity and encourage them to wash their hands before they read about a crime, they become much more lenient. And so there are a whole series of these, these studies suggesting you know, that there's, there's something really going on with disgust. So I think disgust is really important. Now, I mentioned that um, <laughs> conservatives uh, tend to be more, in, in, in both of the, my public opinion surveys, conservatives are much more opposed to harm reduction than liberals. And, uh, and I, that didn't surprise me because I've been a, an observer of the middle exchange debate and the safe sex debates for a long time. Um, but still, I, you know, I wanted to know what, what that was about. And um, I wanted to, in particular, I wanted to, to, to know whether um, liberals, are there circumstances in which liberals will oppose harm reduction? So my, the dilemma was, where could I find some liberals? Um, <laughs> and so I scratched my head for a while in my Berkeley office, and then someone pointed out that we had some liberals in our classroom. Uh, in fact, um, surveys of, uh, of our public policy students in the Graduate School of Public Policy suggest that 95% of them describe them as left of center. So this seemed like an opportunity for me to um, study liberal views. And I really want to emphasize here, I'm, I'm looking at this um, not as a critique of either conservatism or liberalism. My writings make clear that as a public policy matter, I'm quite sympathetic to harm reduction. I think we should be doing more of it, although uh, I face it to point out that there real, there's a tension between prevalence reduction and harm reduction and that there's some trade-offs involved. But in studying this issue here, I'm not trying to poke fun of either liberals or conservatives, but really to try to understand the psychology of what's going on here. So, so the first thing I want to show you is, if you look at my statewide survey, the first survey, these are attitudes toward um, prohibiting heroin versus needle exchange. And Californians strongly preferred prohibiting heroin to allowing needle exchange. Um, with my Berkeley graduate students, um, I find a reversal here. Berkeley students um, notice that they're actually quite similar in their support for prohibition of heroin. Uh, I, I suspected by that stuff and I would have um, found less support for prohibition. But um, they're much more comfortable with the idea of providing clean needles and syringes to injection drug users than California as a whole. Um, so again, this is this kind of among liberals um, uh, willingness to consider harm reduction. I'm willing to, to stipulate here that this, these students are also more educated than the average California adult, and um, that can be a factor as well. It turns out to be very difficult to separate education from some of these attitudes. Um, uh, political ideology is correlated with various cognitive style measures like tolerance of ambiguity, um, uh, a new study that 
which was going to be controversial, shows a pretty reliable correlation between uh, IQ and liberalism, um, and it's uh, and relationships with education. What is, Rob, just before you leave that side, what is the percentage that should be on the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I can't cut it. These are actually means, not percentages. So. Okay. What, what, it's, um, the uh, so that it's agree with that. Uh, one, two, three, four on a four-point scale. So um, right in the middle here would be that the mean is exactly split between favor and no favor, anything above this midpoint. So a three on a four-point scale. This is strongly disapprove, um, somewhat disapprove, um, strongly are we somewhat approved and strongly approved of the policy. Um, and so what you see here is um, California adults are pretty close to the midpoint for needle exchange. Um, my Berkeley graduate students were more enthusiastic. Now, but this is, this, this is just showing what we're all support for harm reduction. And I want, but, but I wanted to find a domain where they might, I wanted to see if there are boundaries to the liberal support for harm reduction. And to test this, I, I wanted to find a harm reduction proposal or harm reduction intervention that met certain criteria. Um, I wanted something that would reduce the physical harms associated with a risky practice, but would not actually eliminate the practice. I wanted something that would evoke a strong emotional response of anger or disgust for North Americans. Uh, specifically North American liberals. That's what I was trying to see, whether I could find one. And then, uh, board, and a particular uh, technical criteria I was looking for, I wanted what are called body tumble violations. Many of our strongest disgust reactions involve risky activities that cross the boundary between the exterior of the body and the interior. So for example, many people, and I have some new survey data on this, many people um, are disgusted by um, tongue piercings, uh, nostril piercings, um, other kinds of piercings. And one of the explanations that's been offered is that it's not just the, um, the notion of decorating your tongue, it's specifically the notion of piercing your tongue. Many people, I believe one of the reasons why heroin has not been more popular in American society is because People find the notion of injecting yourself um, to be so disgusting. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people don't realize you can smoke heroin. And it's probably a good thing that people don't realize <laughs> we, we don't want people to know you can smoke heroin. Um, and this didn't used to be an issue because you need a certain level of purity for it to really work. Um, and for years, our heroin wasn't good enough to smoke. Uh, but now our heroin is good enough to smoke um, and we don't want people to know about that. <laughs> so, well, or do we? I mean, so here's the dilemma. If people smoke heroin, they will be less likely to share dirty needles. Um, yeah. And they'll be less likely to transmit HIV. On the other hand, if people know that they can smoke heroin, a lot of people who are at the margin between trying heroin and not trying heroin, who would not try it simply because they don't want to put a needle in their arm, might say, okay, well this I can, I'm willing to try. So that, you know, this is the dilemma here. Okay, so, so I was looking for something that met these criteria, and I was really struggling until I read a New York Times uh, article by Frank Rudy. Um, Doctor in Italy tries to ease the pain of an African tradition. Um, and this, is, this is an Italian surgeon, and his dilemma was that he had um, families bringing him um, their daughters, families from Africa bringing in their daughters and asking him to uh, conduct a ritual female genital circumcision, a practice that's common in various parts of the world, but is, of course, not at all common in the United States or in Western Europe. Um, there's actually quite a large literature on this practice, and it's, it's well documented that this, um, this practice comes with enormous physical consequences not only um, for, um, as, the, as the girl becomes an adult, her ability to have a normal sex life, but also for the, the enormous risk of infection, uh, urinary problems. Um, it's, it's a very risky activity. 
this surgeon's dilemma was if he turns down these families, they're going to get this procedure done elsewhere. And what he proposed in this article was a simple nick of, of the clitoris with a scalpel to drop a drop of blood to fulfill the ritual. And his argument was, this will fulfill the ritual without producing the enormous long-term health risk and harms. Uh, and the article goes on to explain that many people in Italy were appalled by this suggestion. Um, my own reaction upon reading this was very ambivalent because I had an initial visceral reaction of, no, just don't, just don't do it. There, there's, this, there's, just stop the practice, you know. I, um, and then I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, if a lot of it hinges on whether it's going to happen mm -hmm. anyway. And this is really the harm reduction dilemma. Um, and so I asked my students, um, either before or after they were asked the random assignment, some of them were asked about heroin injection first, and others were asked about um, this practice. But in this case, I would like to ask you about different ways society can deal with risky physical behaviors. One such behavior is female genital circumcision. One way to deal with female genital circumcision is to try to make the behavior less dangerous. So there's less risk involved when people engage in it. For example, an Italian physician recently proposed a more symbolic version of the operation involving drawing a, a drop or two of blood from the clitoris. Um, so, um, people were asked the degree to which they would favor prevalence reduction, trying to stop this practice, uh, and the degree to which they would favor um, this harm reduction intervention when the practice takes place. Um, and what you see here is a reversal. Now, I want to say there are many differences between heroin injection and female circumcision. And I don't want to suggest that anything is being held constant here, and that um, clearly there are many differences. An important one, which I mentioned in the paper, um, is that heroin injection is to some extent voluntary, certainly mm -hmm. at the beginning of a using career. Um, arguably less so when someone's more addicted, but it's uh, the fact that heroin inje injectors are responsive to price suggests that there's choice in the matter. The, the, the girls who are subjected to this are tend to be infants or toddlers. They're, they don't have any say in this procedure, so that's one big source of analogy. But of course, at the same time, it's the girls who would most benefit from having it done less harm, harmfully. So, um, But what you see here is um, my Berkeley liberal graduate students um, were more likely to say, just just stop the practice, just don't do it. And I wanted to know, and that didn't surprise me, I suspected that would be true. Um, and so then I probed, what was behind that reaction? Um, and I asked many different questions about each of these practices, and I found that the reactions statistically loaded upon two different underlying factors. The first, which again I call moral outrage, for lack of a better term, involves the items, when I think about this behavior, I think it's immoral, I feel angry, I feel sad, I feel disgusted. One thing I should say is, psychologically there are important differences between anger, sadness, and disgust. These are not identical. But in this context, people felt a cluster of emotions um, that were very close. Um, and then there are what are more consequentialist kind of judgments, the kind of judgments we train our public policy students and law students to have about um, harm to self, harm to others, um, the actual instrumental effects of these policies on these harms. And, um, and what I found was the pre pre preference for prevalence reduction over harm reduction, this opposition to harm reduction was entirely mediated by moral outrage and was not influenced by the sort of risk management perspective. Again, as in the other studies, opposition to harm reduction is not due to judgments about harms to self or harms to others. It's not due to judgments about harm. Rather, what I see happening in these studies is that people are having an almost visceral 
reaction to a behavior. And if they have that reaction, it makes them extremely uncomfortable with any form of harm reduction which might be seen as enabling or preventing the behavior. Um, I'm not saying this is right or wrong in the psychological response, and I think it plays a role. Um, and uh, resistance in this culture uh, to harm reduction. So what does this mean for legal policy? Well, there's, there's a very old debate in, in legal policy about the role of popular morality and to what extent people's judgments about morality should play a role in the shape that the law takes. And, um, in the mid 20th century, um, the, uh, a in Great Britain, a report called the Wolfenden Report came out recommending the decriminalization of homosexuality. Um, and Lord Patrick Devlin objected to this and wrote a famous critique of this, saying, arguing that in order to preserve social cohesion, to hold societies together, the law must reflect whatever the state is of popular morality. If people think something is immoral, the law needs to prohibit it um, to, to bind us together. And the law should not get too far out of step with popular morality. This, is, um, uh, this has been uh, a been long debate about this. Hart and Dworkin and other people have taken issue with, um, with Devlin's argument. But it's a very influential viewpoint. Most recently, there's kind of a neo-Devlin Devlin physician Dan Kahn at um, Yale Law School wrote a, a paper arguing sort of in favor of disgust as a basis for a law. He said it would certainly be a mistake, a horrible one, to accept the guidance of disgust uncritically, but it would be just as big an error to discount it in all contexts. There are indeed situations where properly, in which properly directed disgust is indispensable to a morally accurate perception of what's at stake in the law. So one point of view is there's just powerful force. This disgust mechanism is such a powerful force, um, and maybe we should use it to, to try to um, channel behavior in the directions we want to channel. Maybe we should sort of honor it and respect it um, in the law. Um, there is another point of view, and um, Martha Nuss Nussbaum um, is probably the best, uh, the most articulate. Um, spokesman for an alternative point of view, which is one of the things that's interesting about um, Nussbaum's writings is she's not anti-emotion by any means. She argues that anger can be a very important positive force in the law. Um, she argues that shame can play a constructive role in law. But when she looks at disgust, she argues disgust has um, certain properties that, that she thinks make it a bad normative foundation for law in this quote here. A clear understanding of disgust thought content should make us skeptical about relying on its basis for law. Disgust is rooted in magical thinking rather than ordinary causal assessment. And it fails to distinguish the act from the actor, undermining respect for the actor's basic dignity. So again, you know, from a normative standpoint, what we do about these emotions and these emotional reactions is an open question. I think people will differ on what role they should play. But I do want to suggest that um, while the disgust mechanism may be universal, the particular stimuli that provoke it are not by any means universal. They are culturally grounded and they vary. Many people in this room are quite comfortable with tongue piercings and body piercings. Maybe some of you have done it or have friends who've done it. Um, and I think that there are secular changes over time in the particular stimuli that we react to. Um, so the mechanism is there, but the particular stimuli change across cultures. Um, now, John Darley, uh, in a program of research, has suggested, very similar to my research here, that um, perceived harms do not play a big role in, in popular support for uh, criminal laws and criminal sentencing policies. That perceived wrongs are a much more important correlate than perceived harms, um, suggesting people are taking less of a sort of consequentialist moral calculus and more of a sort of deontological calculus in um, judging criminal justice policies. 
My results are, I think, consistent with that, and they offer a corollary to that, which is that um, people, uh, Americans, are often willing to keep some behaviors harmful, even when we know how to make them less harmful. Many Americans prefer to keep certain behaviors harmful if they think those behaviors are wrong. So at this point, I just want to open it up for discussion and questions. So, yeah. Any way to distinguish from this work that you've already done harm, where the harm falls, like harm to the person themselves as a form of punishment, in the ontological sense, it makes sense, but versus aggregate harm to society, lost wages, increased medical costs, and things like that. Yeah, now I haven't, um, so, I have first group. So I have a paper with Peter Reuter and Tom Schelling, the economist Tom Schelling, um, some years ago where we, in the area of drug policy, we have this taxonomy of harms. And one of the things we really tried to distinguish was when people talk about the harms of drugs, um, many of the harms involve harm to self. Others involve harm to others. Um, and. One of the things you see when you look at that taxonomy is um, that it doesn't really make sense to talk about uh, drug use as a domain of victimless crime, that, the, that there are many dimensions of harm to others that really play a key role in um, drug policy. Um, but um, it also becomes complicated because, uh, at least in the area of drug policy, those harms are not intrinsic properties of the substances. Some of the Harms are caused by the psychoactive effects of, of the substance. But many of the harms are caused by our policies. So, for example, um, there are opiate addicts who have very lengthy careers of opiate, opiate addiction, but they are physicians and they have access to safe, predictable doses of opiates. They're not supposed to be using in this way, but they are using. And what you find when you study these positions is, and I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but um, the quality of their health and the quality of their life is significantly better than a street addict. The major sub, uh, uh, side effects of opiate addiction for physicians who are addicted are um, in, uh, incontinence, uh, constipation, um, impotence, um, Again, I wouldn't wish those conditions on anyone, but it's very different than the sort of degradation you think of when you picture a street addict lying in the gutter and sort of the Hollywood image. Um, so I did try to probe this. So in my survey, I asked people to judge harm to self of the activity and harm to others. And I asked those separately. Um, and first, I asked them separately because I thought they were real, to, to, as a policy analyst, they're really distinct dimensions. Um, from a legal theory standpoint, they're really distinct dimensions. I mean, the whole um, harm criteria Mills debate is really, really hinges on this. I found that for my respondents, these distinctions were not important at all. First of all, they were very correlated. People did not make a distinction between harm to self and harm to others, which surprised me because I think they really are distinct. Um, but they just sort of, um, it's harmful. If they think it's harmful, they, if they don't like it, they say it's harmful to self and harmful to others. Um, second of all, those judgments were not really correlated with their policy preferences. So I was surprised, partly because I'm a very consequentialist guy. I'm a policy analyst, and, and I'm really looking at, you know, statistically, what, what levers can we pull to try to reduce harm? Um, but that's not what I'm seeing in these surveys, that kind of utility calculation uh, the disgust stuff was really interesting and it made me think of uh, Leviticus in which um, it's largely a, uh, Moses is laying down the law uh, and uh, mo most of which has to do with hygiene yeah. uh, and these violations of and, and whether people are clean or unclean and what we do and something like that and, and these are uh, violations basically of what God has ordained the people are supposed to do. So it's kind of mapping of disgust and giving this moral content. Absolutely. And you know, I'm sorry, I'll well, well I, I mean, sort of relatedly, I would be curious to probe a little bit deeper in terms of what it is about uh, these behaviors that cause disgust and then generate this reaction. I, I'm reminded of 
some of the moral confounding uh, stuff. I, I can't remember whose it is. But Jonathan Haidt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Jonathan Haidt's uh, take on this, he's got a new book about this, I can't remember the title, but very uh, creative um, psychologist who's been studying these issues. He was a, a student of, um, he's a psychologist by training, but he also studied with anthropologist uh, Richard Schwader. And Richard Schwader, Schwader um, made a distinction between um, different moral foundations. And he made a distinction between um, an ethic of autonomy, which is very rights-based, very Rawlsian kind of, um, in, very methodological individualist kind of, very American way of thinking about justice, um, uh, as, as one way of thinking about justice. And he, but he contrasted that to various other ways of thinking about um, justice, morality, fairness, um, and argued that one in particular uh, is what he called an ethic of divinity, which involves issues of purity. And one of the things that um, Jonathan Haidt's studies show is that that's an alien way of thinking in liberal discourse, that liberal discourse does not, and here I mean, actually I mean liberal in both the capital L and the small l sense of the, the word. Um, uh, the um, we don't really, um, in, in the um, traditional liberal sense of um, Locke and, and so on, we don't really have this language of divinity and purity. Um, and American left of center liberals don't tend to use this language. One of the things Haidt's research shows, though, is that conservatives actually do explicitly invoke the language of purity, contamination, much more readily. Uh, and his research suggests, I don't think it's the last word, but his research suggests that conservatives actually have a more multi-dimensional notion of morality because they, they, they do care about autonomy and rights and things like that, freedom, but they also care about things like divinity. Um, and liberals tend to have a, a narrower number of criteria. So to some extent, the two sides in these hot button kind of issues are talking past each other because the discourse allows for these other dimensions in conservative circles, but not in liberal circles. Now, my, my third study here suggests that, in fact, liberals are not immune to these considerations of divinity. Or, um, divinity I didn't measure, but this notion of contamination, of disgust, um, at least there's some indirect indication here that liberals are not immune to this. They, we just don't talk that way in liberal circles in Berkeley. You don't hear people in Berkeley talking about contamination and maturity. When they're talking about moral issues, it's just not part of the Yeah. For a given person, what was the relationship, uh, like between policy support, basically? Right. You you were asking them to rank your support for a harm reduction and uh, mm -hmm. and a prevalence reduction policy, so they were able to say that they supported both or or neither to some extent, right? Do you have an idea of what the relationship? Yeah. So my is major outcome, very, most of the conclusions I told you about are actually based on the difference for where I take. Um, support for prevalence reduction minus support for harm reduction, which is a, a way of getting at mm -hmm. preference for harm reduction. Um, uh, just as a technical point, analyzing different scores, different scores are always noisier, um, and so I also in the tables present just the raw mm -hmm. components, um, which kind of tell the same story. But but one thing that's important to say is, um, in talking about opposition to harm reduction, is that for Californians as a whole, there was a a slight positive correlation between support for prevalence reduction and support for harm reduction. Um, one way of looking at this is that some people are more interventionist than others, and they think we should do everything we can to deal with this issue. Other people are less interventionist, and um, and, uh, and you can imagine why conservatives might be less interventionist just because they don't want government intervention as much. Um, nevertheless, um, when you break it down into subgroups like Protestants, conservatives, you'll find that the correlation starts becoming negative and that there are people for whom these are really, there's a subset of people for whom these are really intention. Um, and uh, I think although that's a minority of people, politically it's a very influential viewpoint. And it's, it's played a role in resistance to harm reduction. Yeah? I was whether or not like the likelihood of uh, successfully reducing that harm with the doctor's proposal, do you think that played a role in the students' 
statistically it didn't, if, if I measured it right. So I asked them to, to um, a question about whether they thought each of the two policy approaches would actually um, be effective. And um, it was correlated with their preference, but this, the sense that you'd reduce harm to self was not the major correlate. Um, these emotions seem to be a stronger prediction. Because you could argue about, um, you know, the, the devils in the details of any of these policies, like how widely is it going to be implemented, what people actually participate in, and, and so on. Um, what's interesting about this particular proposal, the surgeon's proposal, however, is that if, I'm not a surgeon, but if he's right, there really are reasons to believe it would significantly reduce the long-term consequences for these young women in terms of um, possible risk of infection, um, urinary problems, and, and so on. So it was, I mean, from a technical medical standpoint, it was, it's pretty compelling as a form of harm reduction. Um, yet, I do understand my students' reaction because I had the same initial reaction. Just anecdotally, this is not the only case where I've um, sort of had a visceral response against harm reduction. I um, received, uh, uh, so I had this paper, paper in American Psychologist about the psychology of harm reduction, and I, I got a manuscript in the mail from a clinician who works with um, sex offenders, sex offenders who prey on children. And he said he was really excited about my paper because he was looking at ways of doing harm reduction with sexual predators. Um, and the moment I read that, I, I actually dropped the paper on the floor. Uh, I actually went, eh. um, and I, I, you know, it's kind of stunning to me that, that it was such a, like, a physical reaction, but I was like, eh. Um, and so what my reaction was, was it took me a second to realize what he was talking about is, if they're going to prey on children, maybe they can do it in ways that don't do lasting harm to the children. And, um, and, you know, to me, that was, I didn't do any sort of utilitarian calculation. It was just like, it, it just really, um, it was just a strong and visceral reaction, um, sort of precognitive, before I even had time to really think it through. And um, so I, you know, have, I've come to have some, some empathy for people who are opposed to needle exchange, even though I personally have no discussed reaction to needle exchange, partly because I've been working in the drug area for so long, and I really think it's a good policy, but I, I think I can at least kind of understand psychologically what's going on when people really object to it, um, which is a real dilemma. So we can talk about efficacy studies and effectiveness with people, we can show them all the evidence, and there are a lot of these studies for needle exchange, but that to some extent, that's talking past this reaction that they're having, and so it's not going to satisfy some people. Yes? Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned sort of in passing that um, new vegetarians and ex-smokers had a disgust reaction to their sort of former behavior. Um, was that a stronger disgust reaction than people who had never participated in the behavior? Yeah, what's, inter what's interesting about this was um, that it he studied them over time, and it, it evolved. And um, the, uh, I don't think with the smoking one, you compared the reactions of non-smokers. And I think it's quite possible that a lot of non-smokers have a similar disgust reaction. Um, but, but certainly for vegetarians, I mean, most people are not vegetarians. Most people do not have this disgust reaction. What's interesting, so my wife could have been in his study, actually in both of his studies, because she's an ex-smoker and she's a vegetarian. And I, I didn't know her as a smoker, but I did know her as a carnivore. And um, I watched this play out um, because she um, she ate meat for years, and then she made a decision, sort of an intellectual decision, to stop eating meat for health reasons and environmental reasons. And, um, and then, little by little, she started having these disgust reactions to the sight of meat, the smell of meat. Imagine this is a major bummer for me as a carnivore um, when I travel. I <laughs> Lots of meat because when I'm at home, I, I live in a vegetarian household. But, um, so, uh, uh, and Rosen's story about this, and it's 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 hard causally to test design experiments to test this, but his story is um, that this this food aversion 
hardwired mechanism is so powerful that it gets recruited to enforce other kinds of moral proscriptions because it's such a powerful self-enforcement mechanism. Um, and so, I mean, in other words, people who have this disgust reaction are less likely to slip and start going back to eating meat. People who fail to develop this disgust reaction are going to vacillate. And so a lot of them are going to drift back into eating meat. So if you study vegetarians, you're going to overrepresent the people that have this, that were able to put this disgust reaction to work. Yes? Well, one of the views from the next one is that disgust kind of inhibits your thought processes. Have you ever tried to see if you can change people's prevalence or harm reduction abilities by an external disgust modifier? Uh, that's a great idea. I know I haven't, but I think it's a great idea. Um, I think now we're having sort of various experimental models of how you might do that. Um, one of them is simply time. That um, the, um, these disgust reactions uh, are very quick. And in most studies on disgust, they just measure this initial reaction. But in fact, if you have prolonged exposure to the stimulus, you um, develop a tolerance for it. And that happens actually surprisingly quickly. And I mean, as a, one indication of this is now just TV commercials for TV shows, shows that I will not watch, but I can't even watch TV commercials because you will see people, um, police examiners, pulling entrails out of dead bodies on TV commercials. And I mean, it's just things you would never see on television before. And you know, American tolerance for blood and guts has has moved to just astonishing level. When I think about the movies, it really scared me when I was young, like Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, um, and I don't know, you know, the, you'd sometimes see some fake blood and things like that. But now, I mean, it's become so graphic, and yet people have built up a tolerance for it. So um, I do think, um, and and um, there's some neuroscience work that's controversial, but some work on so-called trolley problems, these moral dilemmas showing that um, people, um, when they have a sort of Kantian deontological reaction to a moral dilemma, it tends to be pretty quick. And that it, um, the people who have more consequentialist kind of um, reaction to these moral dilemmas, they actually take more time. And you can actually see in, in the brain a shift over time from this initial reaction, which is an um, rooted more in the limbic system, the very old parts of the brain. And then over time, what you start seeing is the, the, the blood flow, the metabolism demands are moving to the frontal cortex. So we got like, you know, John Stuart Mill up here. <laughs> and, um, actually, I don't think Kant was very emotional, but you know, the, the sort of Kantian reaction is way back down here. And um, so I, I, think, I think it would be possible to design some very cool studies for that. And there's an interesting normative question, which is, um, do we want to try to eliminate people's disgust reactions or try to help people get over them? Um, and I, my predilection is mostly yes, but then I think about this like sexual predator example, and I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, so it, you know, it's, it's complicated. I see we're at two o'clock. I'm not sure. I think we're out of time, but I'll certainly stick around.
Vancouver is the leader in our production. And so it's more of a risk. And so, you, so the real tensions in Canada usually. Um, but um, Vancouver is um, way ahead of other parts of Canada. And so it's, it's, yeah, and it's, so it's kind of intriguing to me. And, um, and now there's new evidence coming out on, on um, Asia, Asian reactions to production. And it's interesting because I, I can tell all sorts of stories about Confucianism and why that might lead to opposition to harm reduction. But in fact, Chinese are taking a fairly aggressive pro-harm reduction stance for both drugs and sex now. Um, and I think part of it is just population health is such a crucial issue. But, so these regional differences in these, these geographical ones are kind of fascinating to me. I'm not an expert in it, but I certainly have to these differences. And I don't know quite what drives that. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well, Ireland is interesting too because Ireland is very Yeah. I mean, for my purposes, that's great. Compared to um, uh, England, for example. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, uh, so the. Uh, um, yeah, these are just.